Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Drew, and we've got another special guest with us today for an episode of The Vocast. Mr. Deke Sharon is with us today. Say hello to the audience. Hello, everybody. So for those that do not know who he is, Deke is an acapella arranger, producer, and among many other things. And you might recognize some of his work from the Pitch Perfect movies. And if I recall correctly, you actually arranged all of the acapella music for these movies. Is that correct? Well, to be fair, there was, there was a team of us working together. It was, uh, it was a, a, you know, many people, big, big uh, group of people, including Ed Boyer, who does mixing yes. onyx and everything like that. So he and I, we were the like acapella insiders and, um, you know, like the, the, the Aka nerds, if you will. And sure. uh, we got to work really closely together on it, which was an absolute blast. And then I music directed. So I taught the music to all of them. And then we recorded everybody right on site in a in a studio that we built on the premises for all three films and yeah. then and mixed that down. And um, they lip sang lips synced to their own voices. So they had to practice doing that as well. And and uh, yeah, it was it was like a whole process. It was multiple things. Plus, myself and Ed sang many parts on a number of the different tracks and, and dust sound machine and the whole thing. That's a cool little tidbit that I didn't know. Yeah. 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 In fact, Ed's voice is on more things than I am because he's he's a SAG member. So when you hear that like universal theme at the very beginning of the first one, that's just mm -hmm. pretty much all him. <laughs> wow. Please don't stop the music starts like just his voice all stacked up. He was like busy one day. I was like running rehearsal or you know, something like that. And he, you know, sure. he just came back and he was like, how's this sound? And he played it. And I was like, perfect. Um, <laughs> I love amazing. it. But then uh, for like DOS Sound Machine, you know, it had to be 18 people and, and uh, only I think four of them sang and then the rest of them were just like dancer models, you know, oh, as yeah. they do in the movies. So then, then um, uh, Ed and I were singing like, not! like you have to sing with the uh, German accent and sound like quasi operatic yeah. and yeah, super fun. Oh my goodness, man. So that is who we have with us on the podcast today. Guys, if you're enjoying the content and you enjoy the guests that I'm bringing on for you to learn more about, make sure you hit the like button, drop a comment down below. Even if it's just a smiley face helps with the algorithm, make sure to check out the Patreon down below and make sure you subscribe. A lot of our viewers are not yet subscribed. So we'll, we'll join us. That. We'll fix that. Subscribe, guys. Come on. Yeah, we'll you know, definitely what's fix that. You? What's it hurt you? Like you got nothing. And then when you've got a little bit of free time, this will pop up in your queue. Right? Exactly. You nothing. Yeah, exactly. And you get some more insight into Pitch Perfect, what went into some of their music, and you get to hear a lot of stuff today. So make sure you hit that button, drop a comment, subscribe. And without further ado, we're going to learn more about Deke today. So we're going to start off with the first traditional question of the podcast. What is your favorite or preferred drink? Oh, boy. Um, it's definitely tea. I'd say sometimes it's going to be like a, like a black tea with a little bit of milk and in the morning, but I'd say if I had to pick one, it's green tea. Unsweet. Green tea. Yeah. You can I've drink never... it all day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, sometimes some wine or a little bourbon, uh, you know, late, late in the evening. But um, I'd say that, you know, the go to green tea, really good green for tea. you. Delicious, light amount of caffeine. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty soft. I've not actually I didn't actually know that they had like a black tea out there. Oh, yeah. Well, black tea, like English breakfast tea. I mean, that's the the standard like uh, morning drink throughout like Britain and the British colony areas and things okay. like that. Yeah. And it's it doesn't have as much caffeine <laughs> as, as coffee. But um, also, if you drink an iced tea that's made with black tea leaves, the difference is um, black tea leaves are, are fermented. Green okay. tea leaves are unfermented. And then there's something in between the two called oolong, which is um, the kind of most popular tea across China. It's really delicious. Kind of, kind of, there's more caffeine than green tea, but uh, there's like an interesting complex flavor profile that you get out of it. And yeah. That uh, sounds like an interesting taste and I might have to give it a try. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> give it a try yeah, later. Day. And you may get it if you go to like a real Chinese restaurant, like a Chinese Chinese restaurant as opposed to like a Chinese American restaurant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's pretty cool. 
black tea. My drink of choice today is Schweppes ginger ale. Uh, good old ginger ale. Some of the ginger ales don't actually have ginger in it, believe it or not, which uh, feels, feels like a, a total misdirect. I did some digging down this rab- this same rabbit hole not long ago, and I did discover that. I was a little baffled that some of these actually don't have real ginger in them. Yeah, it's a shame. The ones that taste really gingery, like the like Cock and Bull or Bundaberg from Australia, amazing mm-hmm. ginger ale. That's actually fermented, so there's <clears> like a yeast in it. Oh, that wow. is an amazing, amazing ginger ale. Yeah, all the oh, man. Stuff. Fantastic. Might have to try some of those. That sounds really Bundaberg good. Bundaberg from Dan Under. It's great. Dan, Dan Under. I love the Australians, man. There's some yeah, awesome me people. Too, me too. I'm excited. I'll be going there for a big week long, uh, two week long festival called Festival of Voices down in Tasmania and Hobart. Um, I've done it a couple years before. And it's like two weeks of all different kinds of vocal music and vocal harmony. And people come from around the world to teach and whatever. And they, they do like a gospel choir and a gay and lesbian choir and a classical music choir and then an acapella choir, which, will, which is what I'll be doing with a lot of other like sing-alongs. I'll do a Pitch Perfect sing-along and um, you know, community events and different performers and groups. And it's, it's an amazing time. It sounds like uh, the penultimate good time for a singer. It, absolutely. Like it's it just it sounds like um, amazing. And yeah, that would, man. If I could, if I could afford to travel that often, I most certainly would be going to something like that. Totally. Well, there are lots of good festivals <laughs> all around the world. Oh yeah, that much I'm sure of. We got a bunch of stuff locally, even. Yeah. Where are you? Where's home for you? So I am above Winston Salem in oh, North Carolina. I'll be there in like two weeks. No shot, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At RJ Reynolds High School, and I'll be working with another high school uh, the day before. Um, yeah, beautiful part of the of the country. And right That's there, that's awesome. Downtown Salem, there's like this great old timey store with all this like, like rock candy and yeah, sweet potato muffin mix, and you go in there and you feel like you're transported back a hundred years. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I actually live less than 20 minutes away from where you're going to be. Oh, great. That's incredible. Well, come, come hear the concert at the end of the day. Come, come uh, see some of the performances. Yeah, we might have to do that. We might have to catch up and uh, go grab some food or something while you're here. Sounds great. But uh, anyway. All right. So diving into a little bit more of a music and intense type of topic. Uh, sure. This one is very broad. What or who got you into music? Wow. Well, my parents said I would sing myself to sleep before I could speak and I would bounce my head on my pillow. <laughs> they were worried about me getting, having brain damage. Uh, by age five, they signed me up for the local church choir. Age seven, I was in the San Francisco Boys Chorus. And by age nine, I was the youngest member of the touring concert group. So I was in operas with Pavarotti and missed the first month of fourth grade going up to Alaska. And I, it was fantastic. So who got me into it? Um, I think I was just genetically predisposed towards it. And actually, like all the people in my family are very artistic, but they're, they're much more involved in the visual arts. Um, and I had some uh, an auditory test recently. It turns out my hearing was too good. I was hearing the blood whooshing through my left ear when there was a little bit of inflammation uh, due to like an allergy or something. And they were right, like, yeah. huh. And the, the, the audiologist said, you know, something I've noticed is that like all the people who come in here who are musicians have <clears throat> particularly good hearing. Like there's something about being creative and being artistic, but then like having strong hearing, like mm-hmm. those go together and that kind of compels you to be a musician. So maybe the answer would be um, some kind of biology, more, more nature than nurture. And because my mother, like she didn't sing, she didn't do anything musical or whatever. Um, sure. She was an artist, an art historian, an interior designer, an architect and all that. Um, but she definitely like happily dropped me off at Boys Chorus and went to concerts and, and uh, helped support me. That's incredible. So a pretty, a pretty significant cho- choral history. Yeah, I started out with um, you know, church music and then classical choral music and, and the kind of boy choir experience, which is much less common now, but it's an amazing tradition and a fantastic way for young people to sing, you know, Absolutely. children's choirs or whatever. Like when you're singing a lot, my son went to a boy choir school as well, Pacific Boy Choir Academy here in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Yeah. 14 hours of music a week. 
And then, I mean, the, the they sang on Grammy winning albums. They toured the world every summer, like a, like an amazing experience. Like when he was 10 years old, he went to Russia. Like I didn't, and I don't, I'm not sure I'm ever going to get to Russia now. Like, let's be honest. But yeah. uh, he's, you know, like that kind of an experience is an incredible, incredible gift that you can give a uh, young kid, you know, male, female, any any gender identification, they're like a chance to be a part of the music and do something at a really high level at such a young age. So yeah, started and it was was classical roots. I was a little boy choir kid. I was kind of, I would, I'd have to say I was probably about the same for me. So I started out in church choir. That was where I started. Mm -hmm. And it was actually local church that I went to, but, um, yeah, that's about where I started. Um, I didn't realize I actually could start singing until I would say right around the age of 13, 14, mm-hmm. right around, of course, when puberty hits. Um, I thought I was a bass at the time, of course. Any, <laughs> any kid that any kid that has um, E flat two is going to think they're a bass. But I've since well, uh, Bobby McFerrin has low notes, but his center, it's where you're, you know, tested to where your center of gravity is. And you're clearly exactly. Not. Yeah. yeah, I'm right there. I, I've discovered that in, in in like a whole year and a half or two years of like soul searching, I've discovered that I'm more closely aligned with the bass berry. So because I got that, I got some of the low range, but um, I don't ha- quite have that. I have a very bright forward mm-hmm. voice in comparison to most people that have this kind of low range. So I'm like, yeah, there's sort of kind of stuck in yeah. between. But your but, speaking voice lives up here. You sound more kind of mid to high baritone to me. Yeah, um, even that and too. And the people who are like, real basses, they're talking down here all the time, whatever. I mean, mm-hmm. really, yeah, yeah. Vocal range does not equal vo- voice part. I mean, it does Absolutely. Like high school choir, because if you can sing bass, you're singing bass. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then, but then once people's voices settle by age 35 or whatever, then, then there's more choice. And honestly, at sure. that point, if you've got high notes, then guess what? Welcome to the tenor section. Right, exactly. Yeah. (laughs) It's a pretty cool. It's all, uh, you know, need based. Yeah, absolutely. And that was something I kind of wanted to touch on at some point later in the podcast is that uh, the reiteration that um, I know some uh, some people that particularly some younger uh, people that are in choral work or in the choral world Mm -hmm. that are very concerned with what they are classified as or what the type of voice they have. And that was something that I like to really hammer into my younger viewers Mm -hmm. is that classification and type matters less than sounding good. Don't focus on something. uh, A thousand percent. The classifications are useful to slot you into a section within a choir. Mm -hmm. A lot of people could sing either one. Really? Yeah. uh, I think a lot of it comes from specific roles that are created for classical vocals. So, so if you're talking about, are you a coloratura soprano? Are you a mezzo soprano? Are you an alto? Mm-hmm. Like, and, and those voice parts actually correspond with really much more traditional roles. So sure. if you're that high soprano, you're going to be the ingenue, right? If you're an alto, you're going to be the, you know, evil countess. You're going to be the whatever. And if you've got a mezzo soprano voice, there are some different roles, but sometimes secondary characters and mm-hmm. things like that. Same as, yeah, same as with men, like the, the bass is going to be the old count. He's going to be the the fuddy duddy, the police officer, the you know, mm-hmm. and the baritone down low. And then the tenors are going to be the heroes. They're going to be, that. and it's just, it's the tropes that were created within the choral, within the the classical music genre for opera and and things like that. And uh, when it comes to a cappella, voice parts are moot. Mm-hmm. You end up singing high, you end up singing low. You end up singing all kinds of different sounds. And it really, um, it just doesn't matter unless mm-hmm. you're an incredibly low bass and you definitely become <laughs> the bass of your group. Yeah. Then everybody else is switching around and singing different parts and, you know, they're utility players, which mm-hmm. is a lot of fun. And it's great to not have categorizations that matter. Yeah, I agree. I'm, a, I'm in a, th- a thousand percent agreement with that because at the end of the day, like it only matters in certain situations. If you know, I mean, sing what's comfortable for you and don't worry about what your type is. Oh, totally. And also in, in acapella, a lot of it is really about, about the breadth uh, of, of you know, how high can you sing, how low can you sing, how fast can you sing, what different sounds can you sing? Because mm-hmm. then you're painting with more colors. Nobody's, right. 
nobody's thinking like, okay, do you fit this exact, you know, vocal role for this particular musical theater production or, or opera sure. or whatever? They're yeah. literally like, well, each song will be different. And let's, you know, when I was music directing the Tusk Beelzebubs, I swapped people around all the time. Mm -hmm. Some of the baritones had stronger falsettos. Sometimes someone in, a, in an inner voice part uh, was really good with rhythm, but they had trouble in this part of their break or whatever. So I'd like, oh, I'll put you here and I'll put you there. And uh, don't worry about what voice part you are, because the tradition in, in that, you know, male collegiate thing was really tenor one, tenor two, very bass. Which sure, one yeah. of the four are you? And by the time I left the group, and <laughs> the group was thinking 12 to 14 part arrangements. Mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of that, honestly, I went out the window. Yeah. But yeah, but by and large, I mean, it's, I mean, it only really matters in specific situations like that. It's, and I know that in acapella, it's, a, it seems to be all, more about versatility and what you're capable of in that tessitura. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Oh, a bit of a tangent, but I felt like it was a good discussion to have without a doubt. Always. All right. So here's another one that's a little deep. Um, who are some of the most influential figures, both in your life as well as specifically your musical career? Wow, that could be long. Obviously, the choral directors that I had, the people who who ran the different choirs, I learned a lot from them, positive and negative. I, you know, I I don't. Uh, I'm not a person who has a lot of like heroes and look at people and say like, oh, well, you you did something great, so you're always you're always perfect. I'm sure. with the Junior Nelson Mandela, one of the greatest human beings of the past century, what he did and how he swallowed his pride and how he brought together a nation, unimaginable, and the number of lives he saved. And it just, it's, un, un, it's incredible what he did and how he was able to transform a nation. Um, mm -hmm. But he wasn't perfect, but he doesn't need to be perfect. That's not right. really the point. So, you know, with my choral teachers, I learned different things from different people at different times and people who directed different groups that I was in. And, and, you know, you learn through osmosis, you learn through experience, you learn, you learn what to do and you learn also what not to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are great musicians, some of whom I got lucky enough to work with James Brown and Ray Charles, Crosby, Ooh. Stills and Nash, like fantastic, fantastic wow. singers and vocalists or whatever. And then mm -hmm. others that, um, you know, whose mu music just made a big difference when I was younger, like Stevie Wonder. And, you mm -hmm. know, you just buy all of the albums and you memorize everything and you learn through mm -hmm. that. And then, of course, great acapella groups of years past, some of whom I got to know and, and perform with and, you know, be friends with, like the members of the Persuasions, the members of the Nylons, Rockapella. Mm -hmm. Like, these are, these are great guys and great groups. And, um, you know, as well as some people who are around much earlier, like the original lineup of the King Singers. Mm -hmm music Ooh, and then that's pretty far back yeah 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 yeah. but you know but they made great albums and and um mm -hmm. and then so many uh younger great musicians who are who are making music today i feel like i'm always learning and i, I go work with high schoolers and i'm like oh right that's a better way to teach this so that's a that's a better way of saying this let me you know mm -hmm. let me leave that because I'm, I'm not on stage that often anymore i've got an annual show at carnegie hall and you know mm -hmm. and i'll perform when i'm in in, in uh hobart Australia with the choir that I put together. But for the wow. most part, I'm behind the scenes and I'm working with other people, producing, directing, mm -hmm. you know, coaching. And so that's that's its own skill set. I sure. know a lot of things, but what's the best way to motivate? What's the best way to to share all of that? Yeah. And um and from that I've also learned a lot from various various mentors and teachers and and such. That is awesome. You've got a long list there without a doubt, and you've definitely had the privilege of working with some in a, a pretty amazing people based off of the history that I've recently done. Oh, yeah. That's oh, incredible. I forgot the bobs. I should have mentioned the bobs. Oh, my God. Oh, I yes. I doing what I'm doing without the bobs. Legends. <laughs> Unbelievable music and so strange and wonderful and weird and funny. and yeah. You'll never find another group like it. You just No, and, and, but, but see, what's so great about them is um, they just did everything on their own terms. They, mm -hmm. they, they, you know, the, the Bob, you know, the whole idea is it's short for best of breed. Their whole point was like, we're unusual, but we're doing what we do. And when they started in the, in the early 80s, they really thought of themselves as being new wave acapella. That's a, a style of music that's, that was very specific to a specific time, like dubstep. Like, it was, mm -hmm. you know, like a couple of years and then it's gone. I think early 80s um, kind of techno-driven, angular pop music. Yeah. And um, 
but they just kind of were themselves. And they did do cover tunes, but they did them their way. And they did a lot of original music. And honestly, acapella is so much richer for their experience. And I wish there were more groups that, that really, you know, followed their own path rather than, um, you know, uh, trying to do just the straight up pop version of, of whatever uh, songs are on the radio and everything, which is also sure. great. I mean, especially educational groups, like, of course, you want to sing this mm-hmm. Taylor Swift song, sing it. Sing it however yeah. you want to, but you're probably going to sing it just like on a recording, which is fine. <laughs> That's, mm-hmm. So do party bands and wedding bands, jazz musicians. You know, they're copying Coltrane. What's wrong with that? Um, yeah. But then eventually, if you want the people who are really going to pioneer and push things forward, uh, it requires looking at things differently and doing things uh, in your own way, finding your own voice. If you sure, feel yeah. that impression, yeah. Finding your own niche within the area of music that you're in. Yeah, and that sound, that the combination of of the way in which your voices work, and how you approach a song, and how you phrase things, and all of that comes together. I mean, when when trying to explain to people what I mean by this, I often use someone like James Taylor, who maybe younger people aren't as familiar with. Ed mm-hmm. Sheeran might be a, a modern equivalent, but you hear James Taylor, and you're like, okay, that's James Taylor. The mm-hmm. sound of his voice, the way he plucked his guitar, like just just he was himself from the beginning, and. And there were imitators, but no one could do it like he did. And in fact, I don't know if people realize this, he overlapped uh, with the Beatles. And the Beatles heard his his first hit, uh, Something in the Way She Moves. Mm-hmm. Something in the way she moves. Like, that's mm-hmm. his original song. And it inspired George Harrison to write the song Something. Something in the way she moves. Like, totally different song, a different mm-hmm. melody line and guitar solo, whatever. Um, but it's pretty great if you can be that young and make a song that makes the Beatles go, Oh damn, wish we wrote that. Yeah, exactly. Like, like that's, that's crazy to be able to do that. Yep. Without a doubt. Yeah. Ooh, there's another one that kind of pawns off the previous question that I asked, but um, what is something that one of these influential figures has said to you that stuck with you your entire life journey? <laughs> I already know. I already know. Um, pretty early on, after I started the Contemporary Tell Society of America, the ICCs were going Boca, the Caras. Um, mm-hmm. I was touring around performing with the House Jacks. And this is before Pitch Perfect. This is before the sing-off, like before things really blew up in the media. Yeah. Um, I just looked at my life and I was like, this is exactly what I want to do with my life. I'm so happy. I, like, I made it. It's working. Yay. Yeah. I didn't expect Broadway and like all this crazy stuff that I've done. So Mm -hmm. um, had a gig with the Bobs at some point. In fact, the Bubs and the Bobs, like the Bubs, the Tufts Beals Bubs, my college acapella group, sang Mm -hmm. uh, and opened for the Bobs when they came through town. And but I went to the concerts back in when I was in high school in the San Francisco Bay Area. Like I've been following for a long time. I knew them. And uh, Richard Green, the bass of the Bobs, was on the Casa board for a while. So at one point, I just turned to him and I said, you know. After looking at all this, I said, you know, Richard, I just want to let you know, like, like you're you're a big reason why I'm doing this and why I've chosen this whole thing for my life. And and and, you know, thank you for being such an inspiration. And and he goes, really? I said, yeah, (laughs) I mean, look at all this stuff like because he goes, oh, yeah. Wow. I'm so sorry. (laughs) He says, I'm sorry. (laughs) I I told you, he was like, wow. Oh, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> I couldn't stop laughing. But it was totally, it, it was entirely keeping with his like deadpan humor and, and mm-hmm. all of that. Like they, they definitely, uh, yeah, it was just part of who they were. So that, yeah. that stuck with me as well. But that's the way it is in acapella. Like some people are like, oh, I want to, you know, chase Grammys and I want to, you know, be on the top of the pop charts and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. That wasn't my calling. I didn't want to right. do that. And at the same time, when I was in conservatory, you know, study classical music, you study jazz, you study world music. And then, you know, but every single weekend, three times a week, I'm rehearsing with the Beelzebubs and we're like learning pop songs. And we're going and performing and bringing down the house. And I think my teachers thought like, like, but that's not real music. Like that's like kind of piddly stuff. But for me, I was like, but that's the way you reach the most people. Mm -hmm. And if we want to spread harmony, we want to get more people singing, whatever. And so that's why I devoted my life to, like, I could have chosen a different style of music. Sure. I first and I have degrees and, you know, all this. But but that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to get out there and and meet people where they were and inspire them to sing as everybody used to in 
past generations. And the yeah. way to do that was with the music of their lives, the music they're singing, the music they love, the music that they're surrounded by, the music on the radio and all of that. Um, so that just felt like my calling. And um, mm -hmm. I have no regrets. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I could have done something else. Maybe I had more respect from the faculty of the New England Conservatory, or maybe had a beach house or something like that. But mm -hmm. yeah, I'm happier yeah. when I'm backstage at the acapella festivals and hanging out with good people and watching all these high schoolers smile and hopefully making a difference in their lives. And, and that's all that matters at that point, right? Yeah, totally. The, I got enough the, money. I'm happy. Yeah. I'm able to live in San Francisco. I mean, <laughs> I'll be honest. It ain't cheap out here. You know, no. You've read. No, no, no. Yeah. But I was born and raised here, so it's home, and it's where, mm -hmm. I, it's where I need to be. Yeah, there you go. And at the end of the day, too, you get to do what you love, and you're happy doing it. Yeah. And at that point, the, the money's a plus. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I can feed, that, my, feed myself, feed my family. You know, it's not a big, no. Yeah. Well, that, and plus, and I mean. And we made it through COVID. I mean, that was the rough one, right? Yeah. 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 No kidding. That was really rough in itself. Oh, here's another one. <clears throat> All right, so for anyone that doesn't know out there, do you play mm -hmm. any instruments, and what are they if you do? Oh, yeah. Uh, piano, I would say, is my main instrument. My main instrument is voice. My sure. main, main, main musical <clears throat> instrument is my mind, right? Sure. And then my voice is my primary instrument. It's the one that that I think through, that I use the most, that you know I've been on stage with and all that kind of stuff. Piano is the one that I would consider my, you know, like if you don't consider the voice an instrument, mm -hmm. then piano, piano is that one. I also taught myself guitar in high school and pick it up from time to time. And um, as a result, played a little bit of bass. When I was in high school, I wrote a bunch of songs and recorded myself on a little uh, four track and, and uh, you know, played guitar, played bass, tiny bit of drums, recorder, you know, like whatever instruments were around, uh, you know, small amounts. Um, mm -hmm. But really, I'd say like, no one's going to pay me to play any of them the way they would uh, <laughs> to someone else. Like if I were in a band, I could get away being the keyboardist. I don't think that'd be a sure. problem. Uh, but <clears throat> there are some people who can sit down and play a score and it's like seven parts. And then they're like, they can like emphasize the second tenor line like while they're playing all the other chords, and I'm like, yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just don't have that kind of dexterity. And yeah. what an incredible skill. I can hear it. I know mm -hmm. what those notes are, but I don't have a way of like, it doesn't come out in my fingers. So, mm -hmm. um, but that's okay. Maybe if I was better at that, then I wouldn't be where I am now. So, <laughs> well, at the end of the day, it sounds like you found your calling anyway. Ah, so far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good, right? Uh, all right. So, um, this one's going to be a little bit back backpedaling a little bit from seriousness level. So what are some things that people may not know about you? Obviously you having the life that you have in huh. music and film and such. What are some fun facts people might not know about you? Fun facts. Ooh, let's see. Um, when I was in high school, I did a lot of visual arts as well. And, and my brother's actually a fine arts, professional fine arts painter, my sister a photographer or whatever. Yeah. Um, when I shifted to, when I went to college and I did the double degree program between Tufts and New England Conservatory, I really had to decide, is it going to be music or is it going to be visual arts? Because like, you got to start getting really good and really doubling down on something. And there wasn't mm -hmm. any real question in my mind. Music was definitely the one that I'd done the most and, and uh, emphasized. Um, so that was the choice, but I had to kind of let the art go. Um, and I don't know if you know, like Duke Ellington was a was a, a painter as well, a fine visual artist and kind of had to let that go as well. But then people say, like, you can hear the painting in his his arrangements and in, in the Duke Ellington Orchestra and all this great mm -hmm. recordings like Harlem Mareshaft or whatever. So I'm not mm -hmm. trying to equate myself to Duke Ellington. You know, <laughs> he was the Duke. I'm just the Deke. Uh, but, uh, yeah, much, much lesser, much lesser. Um, but uh, but I, I feel an affinity to, and I love going to art galleries and things like that when I'm, when I'm out there. Um, That's cool. I love to garden. I love plants and I love to cook. I do all the cooking for the house or 98% of it, breakfast, <laughs> lunch, dinner. And I cook cuisines from all the way around the world. In fact, I, I find cooking to be very similar to arranging because it's about putting different elements together in the best possible way. Mm -hmm. um, and 
like what kind of chef I know. I, I've got a really good friend who's an amazing chef and he cooks all these gourmet meals and he follows the recipe precisely. I'm the kind of person who glances at the recipe, closes the book and then, and then cooks. Yeah. And it was a steeper <laughs> learning curve when I was in my 20s. But now I can open someone's refrigerator in their house and be like, okay, we can make this. Sure. And, and I don't need the precise measurements, or whatever, because I've done it enough times, you know, like, oh, too much of that, or you can't, whatever. Now, that means I'm, I'm, I'm a much better kind of chef and, like, savory cook than a baker. Mm -hmm. Baking is chemistry. you got to be real careful, like, a little yeah. too much baking soda or whatever gets off. Um, but I like that, and I, I like to read a lot, too. I've fallen off um, in the past couple of years, but, you know, at my peak, I'd, I'd read 80, 90 books a year, um, you know, yeah. my little reviews on Goodreads or whatever. Uh, maybe swinging back towards more of that, but um, sometimes work gets real busy and mm -hmm. and all of that, things like that. It doesn't seem. I mean, it's fun for me, but I don't know if it's fun for other people to do. Uh, I don't. I mean, I don't have anything crazy like I put on a clown costume and scare kids. You know, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although I did one year at my daughter's, uh, they had like a Halloween, like autumn fest or whatever, and myself and a couple other dads dressed up in clown outfits and had fake uh, chainsaws and jumped out and scared them all <laughs> that which was designed it was supposed to be a haunted house it was supposed to be a whole experience so mm -hmm. i got a photo of that somewhere oh um, yeah but yeah but i i try to you know live life and have fun play a lot of board games and card games and stuff almost every day with um wife and family and yeah sure yeah that's something also that I might want to mention for anyone that's listening. Um, make sure you take time to decompress. Oh, yeah. It's totally. It's huge, huge effect on your life and your health. Absolutely. And, and slow down, too. Like, um, scrolling through social media, that doesn't actually slow you down. That, that, that triggers your dopamine in a different way. Mm -hmm. Put things away. Take a walk and don't have anything in your ears. And just experience what's around you like mm -hmm. let your central nervous system reset and and be in tune with the, what's actually going on around you as opposed to a great deal of digital and visual stimulus things like that i think can make a big difference yeah that did i did a bit of a deep dive into that as a rabbit hole in case you haven't noticed i'm a person that likes to dig into rabbit holes every once in a while very good and <laughs> but fall down um, yeah yeah exactly but i mean i did i remember reading about that and i was just like i didn't realize how integral decompressing and slowing down actually was to my health and my my mental health even yeah until i actually started doing it totally and some people meditate for me i try to take a five mile walk every day which it's not a short mm. distance no um, climate out here is good enough but when i'm in different places i like to try to walk as well and yeah. And see things and you know experience and and uh just kind of connect with whatever i'm around i don't want to sound too like you know artsy fartsy west coast <laughs> or whatever. but you know it's nice to walk through a park and just kind of experience the birds and the trees and whatever and that's mm -hmm. you know that doesn't have to be like hey man i'm hugging trees it's just <laughs> it's just nice and it's calming Mm -hmm. well, some, some people call that well, like forest bathing or something. I don't know. There are all kinds yeah. of weird words for things. It's just like, <laughs> take a walk in a park. It's nice. Yeah. Like, you know, you, your grandparents did it for a good reason because it's mm -hmm. nice. So go do it and you'll be calmer and happier. Yeah, like exactly. That. Exactly. It's important to, to go to do stuff like that. Yeah. Huh, let's see. Uh, what are some things that you like to do in your off time when you're not working, singing, recording, et cetera? Well, <laughs> like I said, uh, I'd say the cooking, the, the reading, cooking, taking the reading. walks, a um, little bit of gardening and uh, love playing games. So we have a whole bunch of like board games and card games and, mm -hmm. you know, almost every night, uh, Heidi and I'll sit down and like play backgammon or now we're in the middle of a big dominoes, you know, tournament, play all the way around the cribbage board or <laughs> play a little bit of gin. But also uh, we play Dominion uh, when... Um, our daughter Julie and her boyfriend Richie's there. My son Cap's back up from Southern California or whatever. And mm -hmm. they have all these different card sets. You mix them all together or like Ticket to Ride, you know, all, all of those kind of like modern, um, wonderful, social, interesting, a little bit complicated board games. So, yeah. fun. so fun. And you can joke a little and trash talk and talk about things. And, you know, it's, it's great. If, if you want a volatile game to play, have you heard of Hughes and Cues? No, what's that? 
So it's a game where you pick or you have a big old stack of cards. Okay. And then you have a, and this playing board is a huge table sized board full of different shades of colors. And they're, they're they're little squares. Yeah. And on, on these four cards, or on these cards, you have four squares, and these are all lined up in a grid. So like A B C D one yeah, two three yeah, four. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so right to dark and through the whole color spectrum from red to purple and the pretty whole. close to the whole spectrum. Yeah. So what the goal is is each card has four different colors on it with four different grid squares, and what the object of the game is is for you to is for the people that are playing with you to you give them one word to describe what that color is that you picked off of that card. But you can't actually say what the name of the color is. So if I were to say, if I got like a dark red, uh-huh. I would say cherry or some, something not the actual word or not the actual got color. It. Crimson, yeah. burgundy. Like you try to find exactly the right. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, then my siblings would love that. That'd be really great. Yeah, you get yeah. that first round. Then the second round, you get two words to describe the color, but you can't actually say the name of the color. And then the people are putting their little their little pegs or whatever they're called on oh. the board, trying to guess where exactly it is. Got it. And then at the end, there's like this little cardboard square you put down over top. It, it encompasses nine of the squares, but you put it directly over the middle of the person who got it or got over it. the color that you the picked. The color that you picked, yeah. And then- yeah. You get points based on how close. Oh, interesting. Uh huh. Yeah, it's it's really really good, and it's <laughs> jokingly, but it has ignited some really funny little fights at my house when we played that game. Of course, it's yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. hilarious. Yeah, you could get that at Target or just about any major store, as far as I know. I totally, totally. There's there's a fun one called Poetry for Neanderthals, where you basically <laughs> have to like describe wor- describe things, but it can only be one syllable words. What? Which is like hard because you know you try to talk like. This thing is hot and you cook food on it. Like, you know, <laughs> you have to make sure you don't say anything. Uh, anyway, it's, the, and, and you have to go as fast as you can because then there's a timer and whatever. And, and uh, that sounds hectic, but fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have so many like games like this, like and it's just fun. It's fun to spend time as a family and do that. Oh, absolutely. And I've been buying up and getting more card games and board games here lately because I've just kind of fallen in love with the craft. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's so much fun. Oh, back to questions again. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Next question we have is. Uh, so you mentioned that you do sing. Mm. So. Um, how often do you find yourself singing before I actually go into the next question? Many days, most days, but it's not on stage. It's just, I mean, it used to be, I used to be performing all the time, like sure. full-time job, you know, and, right. around and, and you know, you're rehearsing when you're not performing and blah, blah, blah. Um, now it's like singing along with the radio. Yeah. You know, put on the jazz station and, and uh, you know, Dizzy Gillespie's got his solo. Guess what? I'm going to play along with Dizzy, you know, do a little, <laughs> you know, and, and yeah. Yeah. Or um, very often, you know, Simon and Garfunkel pops on or, you know, whatever. And then I create the third harmony because they're only oh, two. Oh, yeah. So then I'll be number three. <laughs> yeah. Stuff like that. I mean, like, I, whatever the music that's on is, you know, it's bossa nova, it's classical, whatever. I am often can't mm-hmm. help it. So I do have, or I do have a couple of questions on here that may or may not apply, but I'm going to ask them anyway. So yeah, sure. back when you were actively more so into the singing as a profession and in the yeah, choir area, Al Shax and all that, yeah, yeah. So what were some of the? How often did you end up practicing throughout the week when you were going through some of that, your choral work and your actual vocal work? Yeah. Okay. So. Um... In the Beelzebubs, we did six hours a week in college, and it was usually, you know, like three two-hour rehearsals or like an hour and a half, a Mm two-hour and a a two-and-a-half-hour rehearsal. Then when I started the House Jacks, we had rehearsals twice a week where we did music, and a third night a week, someone would host a dinner, and we would do all the business discussions and all that kind of stuff. Because early on, before we were full-time, guys had day jobs. I was was arranging and making music and money through acapella, but everybody else, like, until we... Till we got enough gigs that we could get everybody going full time and touring. Um, 
And then for a number of years, like we all live in the same town, so we could rehearse a couple times a week, no problem. Sure. We never did the thing where it's like nine to five, five days a week rehearsing. It's tough to sing that much. And, mm-hmm. you know, we, you know, we didn't need to do that. But then um, uh, once we got to the model where we took different people in the group who lived in different parts of the country or people moved and, and lived there, it'd be more um, you do whatever else you're doing. And then if you got a, you know, a little mini tour in, in, New York, or you've got a thing in Germany for three weeks, or you're going to Asia or whatever, you get there a day early, or you can buy, you get together two days early, like in San Francisco, rehearse, get all the stuff up, learn new tunes or whatever, and then you head over. So it was, it was more kind of condensed. And then those times you'd rehearse all day. Yeah. And have your meetings in between and, you know, have a lunch and all that kind of stuff. Sure. So it really depended. In fact, right now I've been doing a lot of kind of consulting and chatting with different acapella groups to help them out. And especially the more trained ones, uh, they often find themselves like working with people who are singing and doing other kinds of musical things. And then they get together and they have a condensed rehearsal right before they have a particular concert for something because people are busy. And yeah. Yeah. And that I'm going to ask another question that kind of pawns off of that one. So what would what would a warm up routine look like on any given day for you or the groups that you were in? Mm. This is controversial, but I hate warm-ups. Really? I really do. I really do. Uh, and this is why. Um, you know, I wrote a whole book called The Heart of Vocal Harmony, and, and my mission there was to try to figure out and then teach how do you get groups of people to sing with consistent, unified emotional expression? Okay. Sure. So people, everything's been written about how do you sing in tune? How do you blend? How do you whatever? All these mm-hmm. books, all this whatever. Almost none of them, and almost never in my musical education was emotion ever specifically directly discussed. And especially Mm -hmm. when you're in a choral setting, it's very complicated because you've got a lot of different people with a lot of different things going on. They had a whole day or whatever. And okay, if it's Beethoven's Ode to Joy, you're singing Mm -hmm. Walking on the Sunshine by Katrina and the Waves, the emotion's clear. You don't have to tell everybody, okay, guys, now let's talk about joy. But (laughs) some songs are complicated. And also, how do you sing a nuanced song about like, heartache and sadness and how do you get an entire group of people together and have them perform it um consistently that way so Mm -hmm. blah 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 long story short like whole whole book about this right Mm -hmm. that's that's you know a thing and and it's frustrating to me that more the more choirs and more more people don't focus on the fact that emotion is the reason that people listen to music Mm -hmm. and and it's, I think, part of the reason why pop music is so successful in acapella, because pop music, often the emotion is like straightforward and clear, and people have mm-hmm. fun, and yeah, sing. Exactly. Sorry, but I got way off on a tangent, or like, oh, no the first part of your question, what's the th- what was the rest of it? So the, um, oh, I done forgot myself. So um, what is a, it was a warm, oh, what does the warm-up right, right, routine? Right, 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 right. Yeah, warm-up. <clears throat> okay, so the reason that warm-ups are frustrating to me is... We want people to be connected emotionally to what they're singing and be connected to their voices and be very present and in the moment of what's going on. Sure. Warm ups are like guaranteed autopilot. People start singing scales, just start singing these different things, and their brains just turn off and they disconnect from their active voices. Mm -hmm. I find this to be really dangerous because you want singers to actually be singing something of meaning or whatever. Now, yeah. this doesn't mean you can never sing warm-ups, but if you're spending a big chunk of the beginning of your rehearsal singing warm-ups, you're starting by exercising the wrong muscle. You're, you're exercising the muscle of singing and being disconnected to, to your music, mm-hmm. which is a good plus. How many vocal groups have tons of extra time and they don't really need all the rehearsal time? I've never met one. Everybody's right. always saying we don't have enough time to rehearse. So my theory, my philosophy, and what I've done with the pro groups that I've worked with or whatever is always tell them, guys, show up warmed up. Sure. If you're a high soprano and you need to do all this warming up, go for it. If you're a low bass and you just rolled out of bed and you can sing right away, fine. Mm -hmm. Know your own voice, work on it yourself, and show up prepared to sing together. Because when you have everybody together, everybody like that, you should only be doing the things that everybody together is required for right yeah if there are like side conversations different business thing whatever like if you don't need to do that when everybody's together don't do that then 
do mm -hmm. the singing with everyone together. Learn your notes on your own, come together and make the blend and make the song come alive. So yeah. for me, warm ups where as necessary and like, yeah, we would do a little warming up if we're doing a morning show at 6 a.m. and like everybody just rolled out of bed, like, okay, guys, let's, you know, let's lock this together. But generally speaking, I hate them. And often with my groups, I would teach them some improvisational exercises where they could literally just make something up each time that would warm up their voices. Mm -hmm. But also you can't fake it because nobody's telling you what to do and you have to listen to what everybody else is doing. So then sure. they have to stay engaged to what's going on. And yet they can also get their voice warm in whatever range and rhythm and whatever thing they need for themselves. So that's where I kind of land on that continuum. Sure. Yeah. And it's a really good point to make, too, is that a lot of people I've heard people say that people I mean, people would talk about other people and I'd hear them say something about rehearsing for even like an like a warm up. Excuse me. They would warm up for like a good hour sometimes. And I'm like, not only does that seem excessive, like at, at that point, you're just caught. Up, I would feel like you're caught up in the monotony of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's It, it might be hypnotic and relaxing for you and whatever. I mean. People can do mm -hmm. whatever they want in their free time, obviously. Sure. But yeah. then if their voice starts getting tired at the end of rehearsal, maybe it's not because they're not warmed up enough, but because they've actually already used up a lot of the gas in the tank that they have in any given day. And yeah. there are performers who can sing all day, but not everybody. Right, exactly. So it's a really good point there. I'm glad you mentioned that. Let's see. Okay, let's see. Who were some of your personal favorite artists that you've ever worked with at a, in, in any fashion in the music industry? Well, <laughs> uh, well I, I have to like, honestly, look at the old press kits and stuff like that to remember all of these fantastic people. Um, obviously, I mean, there were some comedians like George Carlin, who totally legendary um, and uh, musicians, so many acapella groups, so many singers. And I mentioned a bunch of them beforehand, obviously mm -hmm. the younger groups and people that have, that have been on the sing off, you know, Pentatonix and, and mm -hmm. home free and, and Nota and committed and straight note chaser who wasn't on the sing off because they were already established. Um, and naturally seven who couldn't be on the sing off because NBC was affiliated with Sony and Sony recording contract, but they mm -hmm. were already signed to Sony and, uh, I mean, I could go on and on and on and on with so many friends and so many contacts and colleagues. And of course, the great artists, like I said, the Ray Charles and the James Browns and the Crosby, Stills and Nash and and <clears throat> the Four Tops and the Temptations and the Pointer Sisters. And uh, gosh, like people like wrote, like show me a photo and I'm like, oh, my God, that's right. We perform with them, you know? <laughs> yeah. That kind of thing. Like, oh, I remember that guy was really nice, you know, and I, Starship. Yeah. And and John Sebastian from Love and Spoonful and, and yeah, uh, I mean I like hundred hundreds maybe. Um, and something about that is uh, acapella is such a good opening act because mm -hmm. you literally just go out on the stage in front of whatever's going to happen. Everybody loves it, and it's family friendly, and it works in any kind of situation. Which is why in the house checks we were invited to open for so many different artists. Sure. Um, so for those of you who are listening to this, and you've got a group and get in touch with and, and become friendly with your local performing arts centers, because they're often the people who book the opening act. If there's someone coming through and they don't have their own opening act, or they want to extend a show a little or whatever. And you know what? They give you a little bit of money. They you know provide dinner. You get free tickets to the show or whatever. And then mm -hmm. the real benefit you get is a quote from the from the musician you worked with. And you put that right in your press kit. And guess what? That's, there you go. That's a huge one. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's a really good way to pad your portfolio and to network. Yeah, huge. Huge. It's absolutely massive to be able to do that. All right, so um, in singing with other people or being a part of collaborations, share with us, if you will, some of your favorite moments in some of these collaborative projects in music, or whether if you sang or just been a part of it, mm -hmm, what, what, mm -hmm. just any key moments that really stick out to you that, that wow, stick with collaborative you projects. I mean, there was always, I wanted to do like a musical, but make it all a cappella when I was in college or do something with the dance troupe. And that never really, you know, came to life um, in and of itself. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I'd say doing the opening numbers for the sing off. That, that, that's, one of my favorite things to do is to bring a whole big group of people together and 
have them, you know, perform. And there was never supposed to be an opening number for every single sing off um, episode. It was just supposed to be the first, but it was such a hit. NBC, mm-hmm. was, you have to do that every single show. Um, <clears throat> and the reason for this is most of the time you have a whole bunch of people performing together, you know, like on, on one of those like competition shows, American Idol, The Voice, or like a pageant show, like they're not a group and they don't really care about each other. And so like, it doesn't come together and click. Whereas on the sing off, I worked very hard to create a sense of camaraderie and support backstage. So the groups weren't sure. trying to backstab or whatever. They loved mm-hmm. each other. So yeah. you got this awesome energy and you have seven people, 70 people on stage and you know, all these different groups, configurations and all that kind of stuff moving together. And it was glorious. And that's really what my Carnegie hall show was like each year as well. Different choirs and, uh, Singers from around the world come and um, we do a whole bunch of my arrangements and we have guest stars and groups and, you know, it's usually Palm Sunday, the, the Sunday before Easter each year in, um, in New York and super, super, super fun. And it's that same idea. You bring together a whole bunch of different people. You have a short period of time and yeah. you put together a show. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's pretty incredible. And I'm sure it's just the sense of camaraderie too. That's something that I've always admired with just the acapella industry in general, but even more so with the sing off, just watching people be happy for each other and just mm. enjoying the craft. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's one of the most beautiful things about the show is with all the groups <clears throat> on stage, you could see them like applauding each other and laughing and smiling and joking back and forth. And then when one of the groups was voted off, like there were real tears from the other groups. And in yeah. fact, magazine commented on it. They said like, the sing off is the greatest reality show on television. They were like, you know, they were like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like, listen, like it's showing a different side of humanity and it's supported exactly. warm and connected in a way that none of the other shows are. They're all like, I'm not here to make friends, you know, backstabbing and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and yet that's not the show that I think the world needs right now. And I yeah. sorely wish that NBC hadn't messed up the time slots and all that stuff and that we were still on the air. You know, every yeah. December, getting a chance to show people how wonderful vocal harmony is and, and how healing it can be. Absolutely. And I've always hammered this home with everyone I know. It's I don't know what it is about the human voice harmonizing or just music in general, but it just has this alluring healing effect. Hugely. And it's and it's actually, I think, uh, there, there's a reason that it's at the core of so many religious ceremonies and so many... Um, wonderful moments in people's lives and the holidays and whatever the, the sound of the human voice connected with others is a very direct experience of connection. We yeah. long to be connected to other people. We long for that sense of safety and community and connection. And the human voice delivers this in a way that really nothing else can. Um, I agree. Because music goes straight to our hearts and, and it could be children's choirs. It can be, a you know a whole arena full of people singing along to something you know whatever it is it, mm-hmm. it's it's powerful and um and and absolutely healing absolutely without a without a single doubt i can agree with you on that uh let's see all right so we've got one more question and then we're gonna do a bit of a break from the slurry of questions sure. so, do you have any tips tricks or life hacks for anyone that sings, wants to sing, or was trying to make a career out of singing? Oh, goodness. <laughs> I have so many tips, tricks, and life hacks that I've written seven books. The seventh is coming out soon. It's the Advanced Arranging. It's called Acapella Arranging 2.0 with mm-hmm. Dylan Bell, amazing uh, arranger up in Canada. We wrote, we wrote the first book together. But also, I created a YouTube um, series called Too Many Notes. And this has been going on for several years. And there are different topics, and each one's like about five minutes, so they're like little mini, mini, you know, video casts. But you can just scroll down the different topics and be like, "Oh, that one's interesting to me." And some of them are about singing like an instrument. Some of them are about how do you run better rehearsals, or how do you get more gigs, or you know, how are you more effective when you're competing with your group, and yeah. you know, all of these different kinds of things. And they're literally almost every single one of them ends up having like a numbered list of like these, these, you know, different things. Sure. And it's completely free and there are no commercials on it. So if there are any commercials, when you click on them on YouTube, um, on my too many notes shows, y- it's not me that's putting them there. It's, you know, whatever, uh, YouTube algorithm yeah. demanding that you watch a commercial before the thing, but just yeah. like skip. And then, um, yeah, hopefully there's some good tips and tricks out there for everybody. 
Yeah, absolutely. And guys, at just a quick note, obviously, you know, guys, by now that I drop my guests information in the description below. So that way you can go check them out if you haven't seen them before, or if you want to learn more about them, I always have their info in the description. That will be the same case here with Deke. I cool. will have all of his stuff down below. Make sure you check that description and see his YouTube channel, his social media, etc. It'll all be there. Great. And I, I try not to put anything up there that's not specifically of interest to acapella people so yeah. <laughs> all right so we're at a pretty good pause point for questions at least so my next se section we'll transition to is a section for you to kind of let us know what you got going on in your life self-advertise promote anything you've got going on share what you'd like to you have the floor for the next few minutes to kind of share what you got going on few minutes Oh, if you, if you want, yeah. No, well, no, I appreciate it. I mean, basically what I would say is my whole life's work is to spread harmony through harmony, make the world a better place, to help different directors be better at directing, to help singers be better singers, people who want to start new groups and all that. And I, I, I help people all the time for free. So if you're starting a new group, drop me a line and I'll send you some arrangements and some tips. If, if you've got a group going and you're looking at how to get more gigs or how to be more successful within your school or like out in the general public, you want to go on tour, all this kind of stuff, drop me a line. I help people for free all of the time, mm -hmm. really trying to help spread harmony through harmony around the world and make the world a better place. So, um, and I also post different places I'm going to be. And this year I've already got trips to Australia, New Zealand, Croatia, the UK, Ireland, Italy, Denmark, um, you know, blah, 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 blah. All, you know, all of these different countries as well as all across the US. Sure. So different places and and um and I'll post these things on Facebook or you know periodically on Instagram or whatever. As well as sometimes like I'll take videos of different groups that are performing and post them up there so there's some fun stuff to watch. But bottom line, if you love acapella and you're trying to do something with it or within it or whatever, feel free to reach out. I, I will offer you help and advice free of charge just to make things go better for you, hopefully and make your life easier and and share with you the knowledge that I've learned, but also that I've I've amassed from lots of different people. Um, yeah, absolutely. And guys, it's not often that you find someone who just freely gives out knowledge, at, especially at the capacity that he does. He's got a lot of knowledge in that brain of his, and it's it's free. All you have to do is reach out if you want it. It's in, it's got an My incredible brain, it's individual. Overflowing. Here. <laughs> it's overflowing. <laughs> it's yeah. overflowing at this point. <laughs> well, and I, I mean, I helped Stephen <clears throat> Chaser with their first PBS special. Of course, I made movies, television, the only acapella musical on Broadway. I've written seven books about all different aspects of performing and singing and organizing acapella and running rehearsals and putting on shows and touring and everything. And I've been a performer myself and a singer on stage for a long period of time. So I have tons of experience with the mic technique and pacing a show and putting together a set. And I've arranged over 2000 songs. So I know very well from being within it. How do you arrange? How do you make this work? What are the ways to make it easier? How do you take a lot of the heat off your shoulders and, you know, get past writer's block and all that kind of stuff? I'm mm -hmm. not trying to say this to, to toot my own horn, just to let people like to try to put some topics out there. So people might think like, oh, yeah, that is something I'm, I'm, I'm interested in and and uh, also the people, if you're listening to this, you're like, I love singing, but I never really found a group. I help people find groups all the time. Mm -hmm. Let me know where you are, what you want to do, and I'll help you find a singing group in your area. Yeah, absolutely. Feeling pretty good about your self-promotion. You got any other things that you'd like to mention? <laughs> I'm sure that's plenty. You're posting the social media and whatever. <laughs> and and uh, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to help make the world a better place. And uh well, you get, you're doing a very good job of it. And I will add to that. I actually discovered the opportunity to real, or at least I feel like I, I got the best opportunity. I discovered that post that you had made not long ago on Instagram about the, uh, the arrangements. <laughs> and I have actually, I followed Tim Faust on Instagram yeah, and he, he had guy. shared, he shared that. I love him. He, I, she shared that post. And that right there is where I saw you on Instagram. And I was like, there's my ticket oh there's my ticket to get to reach out to him but yes Great. yeah of course so for um now that we have kind of completed your self-promotion piece this also migrate into the next little section we have where should you have any questions for me before we jump into the finishing questions you have the floor to ask for that as well oh um 
I don't even know what questions I would ask you. Uh, yeah, this this section kind of hits kind of hits my guests off guard a little bit, okay, but I always uh, like to pitch it in there. What do you think are the things that are most needed to help acapella rebuild and continue to grow post COVID? Ooh, ooh, that's a good one. I mean, that's mm. really that's the question on front of mind, and that I posted recently in question. That's discussions I've had with with good friends in the acapella world or whatever, like. Obviously, we're not the media darling that we were a decade ago with, you know, Pitch Perfect and the sing off and all that kind of stuff. So we're not front of mind for a lot of people. Sure. But the key is to not backslide from all of the tremendous growth that we've had. When mm -hmm. I started Casa back in '91, there were a little over 200 college acapella groups. Now there are over 3,000, and high school groups everywhere sing contemporary acapella. And like you know, like I mentioned, it's all over in the media. It's everywhere. So how do we keep it going? What's what's uh, yeah, that part of it, I, th I would think that one thing that would really make a lot of difference is just not losing hope and not losing sight of the goal. Right. I would think that part of it is continuing to push forward in light of the issues that we face coming out of COVID. I, I would I think that's a great thought. I mean, the bottom line is acapella was the earliest music. Mm -hmm. It existed before there were instruments and it's not going anywhere. <laughs> like, no, it's not. There will be yeah. people singing in different styles, different traditions, you know, all the way around the world as mm -hmm. long as humans exist. So it's not like acapella is going to go away, but no. there are people who are trying to make a full-time career of it or a part-time career or whatever. And they're running into more difficulty than existed before COVID mm -hmm. because so many arts organizations have folded because so many choirs have been, you know, cut in half or decimated and, and um, everybody's just kind of trying to rebuild from mm -hmm. from that difficulty. So I think your suggestion to not lose hope is an important one. It's very yes. easy to talk about what we don't have. But what mm -hmm. do we have? We have an art form that doesn't require any equipment really to get started. And eventually you can get some microphones, but it couldn't be much less expensive than that. All you need sure. is to get people together and then you can go out there and perform. And um, this can happen anywhere. It can happen in any language. With acapella, you can you can shift between styles and and different kinds of songs. <clears throat> in the middle of your set, you can take people on a trip around the world. You can take you know a trip through history and do all different kinds of things um, mm -hmm. with your performances. So there's so much that we have that, that's that's a benefit to acapella and being on, being able to be on morning shows and on radio and being able to open up, you know, for performances and sing the national anthem at sporting events. And like, we're, we're easily plugged in pretty much anywhere and you can do any mm -hmm. style of music acapella. So there are huge upsides to it. And yeah, mm -hmm. the music industry is tough right now, um, but it's tough for everyone. Mm -hmm. It's probably a lot easier to be in an acapella group than a bluegrass band. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or and a it's jazz combo. I mean, you know, whatever it is, like there are a lot of upsides. So please don't mm -hmm. lose hope. I like that. Good one. Do, don't lose don't lose the hope because it's it things will move along. Yeah. It, and people it's all in due time. And and people will want to hear it. And there are still people getting viral videos and and groups out there that are making it work. So yeah. And it's it's a really cool effect too, like just to add on to that. It's just the whole TikTok industry. Everything, all the singers we've got going on over there, they're creating a cappella content, just sitting there singing and just getting this groove going and then you've got people who duet that video build yep. off of it and yep. do everything with it it's it's a it's a whole community in itself and it's just amazing to see that kind of camaraderie too yeah that's super fun and that's something that i really that that's one reason why i say don't lose hope is because we have even more platforms and more people rising to the occasion getting more popular you know people drawing more attention back into acapella just by doing these tiktoks and collaboration videos and stuff of like that of course it's something like it in a way it's it's making a comeback mm -hmm. but if we do, it don't if we if we like broaden our horizons and keep our eyes open and really understand how many avenues a cappella has to reach people, mm -hmm. there's actually a lot of potential. There's a Agreed. lot more potential than we even think there is. Agreed. So, but yeah, bit of a tangent, but yes. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. You wanted a question? You got one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Any others coming to mind? Not off the top of my head. 
All righty. Well, in that case, we will move forward with the last sprint of questions we've got. Then we'll wrap this thing up. So um, what is one of the funniest memories you have from working with any of the groups you've worked with in the past? Oh, boy. Um, there was one point at which I was uh, sick during the making of the sing off. And and uh, a few members of Committed in Street Corner, this was season two, I think, they they made a, a birthday video for me singing uh, Deke Sharona <laughs> to, the, to the tune of My Sharona. I think it's still out there online somewhere. That made me laugh heartily uh, for quite a while. <laughs> that sounds hilarious, and I'm probably going to have to do a wild goose chase on YouTube yeah. now to try to yeah, find that. Yeah, you'll probably find it somewhere, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. I love that. Oh, my goodness. All right, next question. What are your thoughts on extended techniques in singing? And do you, <clears throat> so just kind of let me know what your thoughts are if on extended techniques. If I'm, you know. I'm, I'm all in favor of them. You know, unusual ways to use your voice and overtone singing and subharmonics and growling and vocal fry and all of that's great. And I'm also not, not adverse to using different technologies and using a subharmonizer pedal or using a live loop or and finding different ways to marry the voice with technology. I'm still waiting for like a full on hip hop acapella group. I'm also waiting on a group that ends up doing uh, like full on dance music. Like sure. They have like one diva, like wailing over the top of it and a couple other people, like maybe a couple beatboxes and a low bass. Mm -hmm. And they create these like amazing grooves. Um, you could do an entire show like that. No one's doing it. People say like, well, everything's already been done in acapella. It's like, I think it's the opposite. Yeah. Almost none of it's been done. Where's the We're great scratching the surface. acapella group? Where's the great Hawaiian, you know, acapella group? Like I said, bluegrass, is there a bluegrass acapella group? Like <laughs> pick a style of music, almost most of them don't have an acapella group. They don't That's... have somebody who's been doing it. So there are, you know, like before the sing off and, and, and Home Free came in and they were singing pop tunes on cruise ships, but a couple of new members of the group, including Tim and, and Austin, they had country draws, so myself and the casting director looked at each other like, could they be a country acapella group? And during the course of the show, we figured out what country acapella is, and now they're doing the Grand Old Opry and touring all over, and they mm -hmm. defined it. So if you think like, well, that can't really be done, no. It can yeah, done. it can. <laughs> it has been done, and there's so much more to do. So mm -hmm. please don't don't get stuck and think that we're we're like done and it's all been thought of. It's mm -hmm. the opposite. Is more hasn't been done than has been done. Exactly. It's literally scratching the tip of the iceberg. Mm. It's and it's that also, you know, those pictures online of of icebergs being like just a little bit up top above the water yeah, and then and gigantic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Untapped potential. That's exactly right. Untapped potential in my personal opinion on that. OK, next question. We're coming up to the some of the some more of the ending questions. Uh, do you have perfect pitch? No, and I'm glad I don't. Started to get it in um, boys' chorus, but I didn't want it. Like, <laughs> it's something that people learn. Like, and and uh, I uh, acapella shifts, and honestly, the whole concept of a four forty being correct is an total construct. Mm -hmm. it, it's just a name. It's like saying, okay, that's true red. No, wait, mm -hmm. that's true red. It doesn't matter. It's all yeah. a reference point. Um, and something that's interesting is. People who live in countries that use tonal languages, like in China and in, in Thailand, they have much higher rates of perfect pitch throughout um, the general population because people are just used to listening to tone more. So mm -hmm. ultimately, I, you know, might have been beneficial at times to be able to get a starting pitch without an electronic pitch pipe or something <clears> like that. But ultimately, it's, you know, those perfect pitch people sometimes freak out when the group, when the song sh drifts sharp or flat. But that doesn't matter, you know. Yeah, and I I can agree with you, and and it's it's kind of and it's kind of annoying to have. I'm not gonna lie. I'm sure. Yeah. It, it it's it's really annoying because sometimes your brain. It's like I said on my, a couple podcasts ago when I was talking to Jay Nunn. I was we we had talked about it, and I told him I was like hearing a door creak and your brain telling you. It's what? an F sharp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it sucks. <laughs> That's funny. Well, by the way, I have a, a joke about perfect pitch. How can you tell if someone has perfect pitch? Uh, good question. Don't worry, they'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Is it not true, though? It's 100% true. Yes, and very much so. 
Yeah. It, and it's and, and most of the time it's not even uh I have perfect pitch, I'm better than everyone. It's not like a bragging thing, it's just it just kinda happens. Yeah, but no, it comes up. Yeah. Yeah. It it, it ends up it ends up coming up one way or another. Yep. Uh let's see, next one. What is one of your favorite things about me about where you're at in the music industry? About where you specifically are at. What's your, one of your favorite things about it? Oh wow. Um I love that acapella has very little like overlap with what you would call the mainstream world, which means basically there aren't a lot of sharks. There aren't a lot of people who are in it just for the money. Like it's everybody who does it is, is, is somebody who likes doing it. And so like I'm in a community, I have so many friends and so many contacts and I see these people around the world like, Oh my God, how are you? I haven't seen you in so long. And it all just feels friendly and supportive. Right? Absolutely. Uh, there are rare exceptions and, and you know, like, like there isn't anything, but for the most part, it's just a wonderful, safe, supportive place to be. I um, agree. Yeah. And, um, and so that, that just, that feels good. It, it is I'm, without I'm a doubt in, an incredible feeling. I'm happy with and proud of the acapella community that has taken part in, in, in building. Yeah, absolutely. And I've discovered the same thing in, in, in my music journey, what little time I've actually been out here. It's just the people are so welcoming and friendly and they're willing to offer you advice, participate in collaborative projects and all that stuff. Right. Willingly. Yeah. It's incredible. All right. I've got one really good question that I'm actually going to say for last. I do have a couple of viewer submitted questions. Okay, cool. Um, this is actually from a gentleman, I believe, who either got a picture uh, with you at some point in the past or. Okay. <laughs> so do you remember BYU? Well, very well. Uh, yes. I, I've, I've been there multiple times and I worked with BYU Vocal Point and Noteworthy on the sing off back, um, you know, in the early seasons of it. And in fact, BYU uh, Vocal Point made me an honorary member at their 25th anniversary. So when I was back, I did a fan X thing, like one of those like fan conventions that are mostly like superheroes and mm -hmm. you know, all that. They had me in the little booth and they flew me out and all that kind of stuff. And since yeah. it was happening in Salt Lake City, um, I got a chance to meet the current lineups of, of Noteworthy and um, Vocal Point, as well as some of the members who were in it beforehand, you know, old sure. friends that in a long time um and so great group unbelievable tradition at those schools and mm -hmm. uh yeah mind-blowing without a doubt this or this one or this question comes from one of the bass singers over in byu acapella club okay. um his name is evan he said if you had to make a mount rushmore of acapella arrangers and songwriters who would be up there and why oh goodness like songwriters and arrangers like mm -hmm. Oh, my God. I mean, of course, I get myself into trouble if I say anything. Why didn't you include this person? Why didn't you include me? Why is it all these kind of people? I think you're, I think you're going to have trouble not including Gene Perlin. Gene Perlin. I think he's, he's an, enormous, an enormous person and a big name. I think Bobby McFerrin also is a must-have. Mm. Um, you know, it, it, it's not just his arrangements, although he was a genius for the way he wove together things like Blackbird and the voice and the fact that he's jumping his voice all over and doing all of it. He, his arrangements are less for anybody else and more just like, look what he can do with his own voice. Mm -hmm. um, but he's also the only person on the planet that's ever had a number one billboard hit with an acapella song. So, you know, mm -hmm. he's, he definitely, he ticks that box, which, Absolutely. You know, which is a huge one. Um, wow. I'll leave it at two right now. There's Let's room for, for two it. more. There's room for two more heads. We'll find out who they are in the future. How about that? <laughs> yeah. That sounds that sounds like a really good synopsis of who I would probably put up there myself. Mm -hmm. He had he had one more or two more questions for you. Um, what aspects of arranging, production, and or performing do you think set up a group for a big break? A big break. Like a breakthrough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the group has to be good and, and like, gel. Like, if they hate each other, it doesn't really work. So they got to work together interpersonally. And they have to have rehearsed together enough to have, you know, a sense of a sound and a bit of style and all that kind of stuff. Sure. Um, uh, recording techniques now are so kind of ubiquitous. I don't want to spend much time on them because the key really, though, is you can fix pitch, you can fix rhythm. 
you can't fix energy. So you got to put that vibe in the recording. You got to sing with your heart. You can mm -hmm. record in your, in, in your, you know, bedroom at 3 a.m. if you want with the laptop. And I mean, that's the way everybody's making music now. Anyway, you don't have to go into a brick and mortar studio. So, so you, you can focus on the performance over, you know, over the, um, anything else and do it when you're feeling wound up and, and right for it. But I'd say the number one thing that really sets people up for success nowadays is video. You know, it's online, it's YouTube, it's, it's viral videos. And, and, um, there are ways that groups have been, you know, have launched that haven't involved video, but not much, not much mm -hmm. in the past decade. And Straight No Chaser got their big break with having one of the first YouTube viral videos with their 12 Days of Christmas, but then it was the PBS special that turned around and launched them. And yeah. time, I mean, they were basically put together for the sing-off, you know, like assembled and met each other the night before auditions, you know, and, and then, and then, they had the sing off, but then they made a bunch of videos and sitting on a couch and built mm -hmm. their fan base that way. You know, you talk, take a group like Voctive that's in, in Orlando, members of Voice of Liberty, great people, great voices, great harmonies. Um, mm -hmm. Their videos are the things that, you know, went viral and then now they get asked to perform and tour around and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's video. I really do. I, I think that's the way nowadays building yourself touring without having video is almost impossible nowadays. Whereas yeah. in, in ages past, <clears throat> most of the groups wouldn't have had any video because it was so expensive to make sure. until they found themselves on a PBS special or something like that. Sure, yeah. And one more question from Evan. If you had gotten your way and Pitch Perfect 3 featured an intergalactic acapella competition. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> he did the, listen to me. Ah! He did. He said, uh, would the other planets groups sound more or less like uh, Earth's acapella groups, or would it be like a humans and aliens type situation? That, okay, that... yeah, L let me spell this one out. So Evan must have heard <clears throat> me or I was talking with him or overheard. So I thought the third movie, moving away from acapella groups and you know, having to be like different bands and stuff like that. I mean, as mm -hmm. my you know, 11 year old daughter said at the time, she was like, Dad, that completely defeats the purpose of the brand. And I was like, thank you. Like, how hard is this? Yeah. I love Elizabeth Banks and her husband, Max, and the people who produce the movie. So I don't mean to be throwing grenades or whatever, but mm -hmm. um, the first movie was the, you know, the college acapella competition. The second movie was the international acapella competition. Great. Where do you yeah. go from there? Why did they go to some battle of bands? They should have gone to the intergalactic acapella competition <laughs> and made the movie like like Galaxy Quest, where you've got mm -hmm. all these people in ridiculous rubber suits, and it'd be like the sock puppets in, in the first movie. Where, but you know, you could have an entire group of those, blah, 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 like all our voices sound like that. So, mm -hmm. bottom line, I think it'd be more fun if all the groups sounded different, and then. <laughs> You know, but they like had like a lead singer that was English over the top of it or some kind of a translation thing. And there's so it could be so it'd be dumb. It would be dumb. <laughs> but the biggest thing about comedy movies is um, and the reason like Hangover 1 was amazing. Hangover 2 is pretty funny. Hangover 3 was, you know, um, and kind of like Pitch Perfect. Uh, unlike a James Bond movie, we can have different villains, different locations, different stakes, different settings, whatever. With comedy, like each time you go back to that same well and you make jokes about the same thing, you've already made the jokes, you've made the good jokes. So it's harder and things aren't as new. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And an intergalactic one would have been stupid fun and there would have been a million jokes you could have made. You know, absolutely. So, There's a lot of potential there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think it'll ever get made, but that's my uh, that's my elevator pitch for you. <laughs> All right, I've got two questions from Mrs. Chuck here, and w that'll wrap us up for the day. Okay. Uh, so why do you believe that it is hard for acapella material to get radio airtime? Okay, let me start by saying there was a period of time uh, hmm. the f from about 1987 to 1996 that there were acapella songs on the radio. Um, the first was uh, The Nylons, Don't Worry, Be Happy, went to like number 11 here in the mm -hmm. U.S. And the last one was uh, Peter Cetera and an acapella group called As Yet, doing Hard to Say I'm Sorry. Um, and in between there, you had Don't Worry, Be Happy, which went to number one. You had It's All Right. Have a good time. Huey Lewis in the News doing a was it Teddy Pendergrass, uh, um, you know, benefit album, somebody like that. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, some other like shy, if I ever fell in love. There were songs that were on the radio and Boys to Men was the only group that had two. They had 
um, It's So Hard to Say Goodbye to Yesterday, which was, you know, big top 10 hit. And then also mm -hmm. uh, they did In the Still of the Night for a Jackson 5 TV show special, whatever. Um, kind of like a, you know, remake documentary situation. And mm -hmm. so there were songs that were on the radio. Um, but almost all of them were existing groups that ended up doing an acapella song or groups that, that leaned mostly into instruments and then they happened to have the song um, that they did acapella as well. Like he was in Lewis and the News or whatever. Bob McFerrin sure. was absolutely out of left field. Nobody expected it. Captured mm -hmm. the zeitgeist of the, of the early 90s moment um, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I think it's hard for acapella to get on the radio. I think it's hard for anything to get on the radio. And doo-wop a lot of those songs were written a cappella, but then when the producers got them they added a bunch of instruments in the background and then made an album and put it up there djs are not in the business of taking risks because they don't want to they don't all they want to do is sell advertising if you're wondering yeah. how commercial radio works if you're wondering how commercial television works you, you, <clears throat> the, the show <laughs> like what's the product you're the product your mm -hmm. eyeballs are the product and the shows exist to get you to into the hands and the eyes of advertisers yeah and it doesn't and the, just so many television shows are so you know obvious and middle of the road and don't take risks or whatever unfortunately like we've just ended peak tv which is a whole different conversation there was a time for creativity and i think we're on the back end of it and it's it's over you can read the articles about it um mm -hmm. but the bottom line is they don't want to take big chances because they don't need to and like like they want big stars. They want Madonna's. They want Ed Sheeran's and Adele's and Taylor Swift's and whatever, because it's kind of tried and true. Like it's a much better chance that huge advertising dollars, huge, you know, recognition. Like Taylor Swift, the reason she's so popular, she's fine. She's a solid musician. There's nothing wrong with her, but she's mm -hmm. in the media all the time. Mm -hmm. And then people are interested in her and that drives interest in what the next song is going to be, whatever. Yep. There are people who sing better than her. There are people that, who write better songs than her or whatever, but there aren't many people who do a better job being in the spotlight. Mm -hmm. And Madonna tapped into that. And frankly, ever since MTV, it's, it's so much more about how much attention can you get and sure. how good do your photos look and can you be on the covers of magazines and you know be scandalous and all of this um, because we don't know who this generation's Aretha Franklin is, right? Who sure, is she? yeah. And where's the Carol King that's writing songs that we don't know about? Like, like I just don't think we have those people right now um, getting the platform that they need because what people really want is is an all-in media experience and package. So sure, yeah. Acapella doesn't really have that. Like, we're far enough back because we, we don't have instruments in it, but also we'd have to have the right combination of people and money and all that to kind of get into the, the public ear. So sure. that's the challenge there i think i'm afraid yeah then that, that's kind of what i was thinking too in in diving into the whole acapella side of music too whenever i first started that's kind mm -hmm. of what i was thinking but there will be more it's gonna happen sure yeah who knows who i mean I, when when acapella was growing then i really thought that the group that was going to break through the glass ceiling and become the, the next big huge globally known acapella group was going to be a collection of guys because that's the format that most groups were in and the fact mm -hmm. that it's pentatonics and they were diverse and you know like it was like great that's even better that reflects you know the world and media and all that kind of stuff much better right now and they're lovely people and they've done an amazing job like you know waving the standard bearer mm -hmm. um being standard bearers uh so who's going to be that next group that's going to get on the radio i don't know but it will happen yeah at some point that's what i'm thinking i'm i'm in Pretty confident that we're going to have somebody from the acapella industry hit that rise to that occasion. Sure. Last question for Mrs. Chuck and last question of the podcast for the day. So what new directions are you seeing in acapella music? As an example, makeup of the group, song choices, arrangements, visual presentation, any, any mm. new directions are you seeing? Good question. Um, I'd say if we look at college acapella, you go back a generation and it's the all male and all female groups on campus who are the legacy groups who get all the attention. Now, many college campuses have a dozen groups and except for those, you know, couple original groups, everybody else is a mixed group. And they end up like having like, we do only 80s music. We do only Disney music. You know, there's even a group that's like all pirate acapella and they're like, arg. Um, mm -hmm. So I think uh, a big trend in the, in the college acapella world is the fact that the groups like mixed 
you know, gender identification less groups really are the norm right now. And I think that's, I think that's what the future is going to be. And we could get into long discussions of the way in which single gender groups were portrayed in the media and had a certain sexuality and energy to them that mixed gender groups didn't in previous generations. Sure. And I think a lot of that's gone, which is a beautiful thing. So anybody can just be themselves however they want to, and the group can just do its thing. Um, when it comes to professional groups, I think post COVID kicked everybody in the teeth mm -hmm. and the really big groups have come out soaring pentatonics and strano chaser and home free. And, and they're all out on the road and, and doing great. Um, the groups that were just getting started, a lot of them like floundered and some of the smaller festivals have closed and things like that because, because life and money and, and I mean, a lot of major performing arts organizations closed and symphony orchestras mm -hmm. and things like that. So it wasn't just acapella. It was the entire arts world. It was, Anybody who was creating stuff and had small little businesses, how many restaurants closed, you know, how many mm -hmm. small mom and pa shops and stores and downtown and all that kind of stuff. So, yep. um, you know, it, it affected everybody all over the place. But my sense is that they're, you know, the groups that are smart and figure out the right way to get that music out there. And there are groups on, on that are doing really well on on. Um, TikTok and whatever with short form things like like the trills and T3 who are actually my guests at my upcoming Car Carnegie Hall show in, mm -hmm. in the month. Um, mm -hmm. They're doing well. They're getting those eyeballs are getting people excited, you know, they're and they're the next young generation of what music is. What choice will they make that will be different? You know, will someone do a musical? Will someone be a combination acapella spoken word thing? Will there be rap? Will there be electronica woven and where it's like all kinds of looping going? I don't know. But that's mm -hmm. what's so exciting about it. And I urge groups to take those chances and play with things and and see what really works for them so they can find their own sound and style, because I'll be the first one lined up to buy that album. And oh, yeah, nobody buys music anymore. But I do. Yeah, exactly. Like at the end of the day, too, it's nice to keep some of the older traditions upheld. Absolutely. And that stuff's still going to be out there in this, and, you know, and the King Singers are still going and the real group's still going and Rioton and, and groups that, that are more choral in their tradition that I just earlier today talked to Ardu out of Ireland. Beautiful, beautiful harmonies. And, and so all of that still exists. That's the beautiful thing in acapella. New people doing new things does not in any way invalidate all of the other things that have been going on for a long time and keep going. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> big, big tent. Big for sure. Ooh, folks, we are coming up on the end of this podcast. We're just shy of an hour and a half. Deke, it was a pleasure having you and My learning more about you. Well. Time to Thank go pick up the 12 year old from school. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Guys, if you enjoyed the podcast and you want to hear more and have, see more guests come to the channel, make sure you do what I said at the very beginning. Drop me a like, throw a comment down below, even if it's a smiley face. Check out yeah. the Patreon if you're looking to support the channel in a big way. And make sure you go check out our fellow Deke. Check out his social media, his YouTube. He is a wealth of knowledge, and you, seriously, if you have any questions about singing, acapella, anything at all, he's your resource. Trust me. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thanks for Thanks. having me on the show. Thanks for such great and, and uh, unexpected questions. I've done many Absolutely. a podcast, and often they ask the same questions, and um, I, pretty much everything you asked me was was new and took things from a different angle. So thanks for the thoughtfulness and the creativity behind it all. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for helping me maintain the mission of the channel is cultivating everyone's understanding and appreciation for music. This is what I do with these podcasts and everything I do on the channel. And thank you for helping me do that by being an incredible guest. My pleasure. Guys, thanks. thank you. Thank you, everyone, so much for tuning in. We love you. Take care of yourselves, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, before we end this video today, I wanted to give a shout-out to Miss Nancy Flesher, one of my many patrons. If you would like to get a vocal shout-out like this at the end of the videos, make sure you check out my Patreon link in the description. Love you. Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you in the next one.